morning, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, my financial uh, background. <laughs> he sent me a, a job offer that included this statement. Um, your role will be to help architect and uh, engineering WS to product better so for financial services. Uh, market as well as to liaise directly with the customers and working them to build innovative solutions. So I think the financial okay. financial services uh, part didn't happen for some reason because of the priorities, but I think liaising with the customers and building solutions did work well. After nine years, I think uh, Seishi managed to get it done somehow. So it's an opportunity for me to question uh, how she did that as well. Okay, so I'll introduce the panel. Uh, uh, so starting from the corner, um, Richard Smith, uh, who's the enterprise architect uh, of Bank of Cyprus, UK. Uh, Richard is specialized in business and digital transformation uh, as a key part of his uh, current role uh, and involving in the bank's uh, compliance with the PSD2 as well. Um, then uh, we have uh, Chris Michael. He's the head of uh, technology at Open Banking. In his current role, uh, Chris is uh, leading the API teams at uh, Open Banking, defining the API standards uh, to meet CMA uh, remedies for Open Banking in UK. Uh, welcome, Chris. And then uh, we have uh, Mache Maholak. So uh, he's a global uh, technical product manager uh, for HSBC, uh, especially uh, on the secure access side of the bank. And he specialized in cybersecurity, data privacy, uh, so and so forth. Uh, welcome, Mashe. Um, then uh, we have uh, Seishi. I'm not going to uh, introduce uh, Seishika. She was the uh, uh, keynote speaker. Uh, then I have Prabhat next to me. Uh, Prabhat Sirivardhana, who's the senior director uh, of the security architecture at WSO2. So we call the security person um, at WSO2 as Prabhat, and he wrote many books, and one book uh, that called the API Security Standard Book. Uh, many customers refer that as well. If you have not read, uh, I think better to refer that. Uh, so, and uh, Prabhat is based in California as well. That's the uh, uh, panelist that we have. So, uh, to start with, I would like to uh, ask, ask each, each one of you. Uh, each one of you have been involved in open banking and PSD2 initiatives. So, share your contribution and your role in these uh, initiatives. Uh, probably we can start from Richard. At the end, yeah. yeah. Um, so, probably ignore most people over there actually, because <laughs> this is a wide, uh, wide audience. Um, so, uh, yeah, Richard Smith, as you said. Um, PSC2, so it's been more of a uh, sort of a side uh, responsibility. Um, obviously, um, as stated, I'm there for more digital transformation. Uh, we're seeing PSC2 as a fit in that space. Um, we're mainly splitting this into two halves. We've got the TPP access to bank systems and we've got the rest of the general compliance. Um, I advise on the general compliance, and I'm working very closely with the rollout of the um, systems that we'll use for TPPs to access. Chris? Thank you, yes. Uh, so my, my role at uh, Open Banking Limited, um, well, first of all, let me just clarify something. So Open Banking is a big global concept. Uh, rather confusingly, uh, our company is called Open Banking. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually a limited company. We were set up by the Competition and Markets Authority, UK government, at the back end of last year. Um, and we are a non-profit company. We, we have a, our current funding model is that we are funded by the nine biggest retail banks in the UK, uh, known as the CMA9, including HSBC. Um, and... Um, we uh, are, but we're non-profit, we're, we're independent, um, and our, our role is to create the open banking standards. Initially, the focus is on the UK and for the CMA remedies, which is a subset of 
PSD2. It doesn't cover all of the different account types or currencies that PSD2 covers. Um, so what we've, uh, what, what my teams have been doing is building those standards in uh, in the UK, and we published the sort of first. Well, we published some open data standards which aren't really relevant in the context of, well, aren't so relevant in the context of PSD2, but the read-write API standards were published in the middle of the year uh, this year, and um, we're working now with CMA9 together with a number of other, uh, quite a large and growing number of third parties of TPPs and also a number of other banks to go live with the first version of open banking in, in January this year, uh, January next year, January 2018. So my role is to kind of uh, lead the, um, the, the, the generation and production of those standards. Um, this is a very much evolving feast. We are also looking at um, uh, how we extend and adapt those standards to cover the wider use cases of, the, uh, of PSD2. So that's something that uh, sort of watch this space that we're looking at bringing out uh, probably early next year. Thanks. Meshe? Um, hi, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so, um, as Asanka mentioned, I'm the Global uh, Technical Product Manager for HSBC. I work in the core uh, security team, <coughs> uh, working on, uh, on the security platform uh, that the, uh, the bank uses or, or will be using across all the markets that we operate in. And um, my involvement uh, with, uh, with open banking or, or PSD2 is somewhat uh, limited as, as I work on, on the security product, uh, which is obviously will be used by different markets, uh, will be used by open banking as well. Um, and uh, my, uh, my focus is primarily the, um, the authentication or strong and adaptive authentication, how the, <clears throat> how the platform looks at users, how it authenticates, make sure that uh, the uh, that the identity of the user can be um, uh, can be verified on the on the side of the bank. Sishi, um. I think the keynote was self-explanatory <laughs> about my role. Uh, so basically, my role is to understand the technology requirements uh, for PSD2 compliance, but also envision uh, for uh, our customers uh, as to how this this regulation can be used for broadening their businesses through digital transformation and obviously putting the technology components together to help customers get there. Prabhat. Yeah. Uh, so my role at WSO2 is mostly to oversee the security aspect of all the WSO products. And I closely work with the WSO2 identity server team. And in terms of uh, PST2 and open banking, uh, both these uh, standards uh, have a very dependency on identity access management and also the security of APIs. And we have Sashi and the uh, financial solutions team building PSG2 and open banking solutions for our customers. My responsibility there is to make sure we have the right level of support from the identity access management stack and also the right level of security from the API stack to build a more robust, secure uh, PSG2 solutions for our customers. So I think your contribution, I should mention about your blog, because even I learn a lot from by reading your blog and share the URL with the audience. Yeah, uh, so it's uh, facilelogin.com. Uh, so I do some uh, evangelization stuff too, uh, both on open banking, PST2, GDPR, and also on IDA. Thanks. So uh, I'll start with Richard again. Yeah. Um, so Richard, uh, what's the real status of PST2 in the financial industry? And have banks really thought about it as a uh, just to compliance or with a long-term vision and a plan with that? Uh, can you share some thoughts on that? Um, potentially. Um, I'll go to a lot of these things. Uh, talk about um, open banking, PSD2. You, you hear a lot about the TT, allowing access to TPPs. That's generally all you hear about in these sort of um, conferences. Uh, we tend to forget about the rest of PSD2, the, all the payment compliance. Um, I think banks largely should be well structured to follow those regulatory changes. Quite rightly, we focus on TPP because it's, it's a new thing. It, it, it's, banks traditionally like to lock the safe. Mm. You know, it, the security guys effectively that keeping your assets secure. Um, to allow third parties in, probably a bit of a mindset change. But largely, banks are, are going through digital transformations of their own. It's <laughs> um, so, sorry, they're largely going through digital transformations of their own. Um, banks 
traditionally have been very product focused. This might be slightly better. Oh, I can hear myself now. Um, banks have traditionally been very product focused. Um, largely, when we look at digital transformation, yes, there's the efficiencies, there's the integration with the mobile and everything else. But ultimately, we're just trying to get it, integrate better with customers' lives. That's what we're trying to do with banking. Integrate better with customers' lives. Um, if you are a bank of that mindset, then actually adopting PSD2, not a million miles away from probably the sort of strategies that you're currently looking at, especially in terms of the uh, technology stacks. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you talk to the different industries. A lot of people are saying, wait, to, in terms of the typical big four consultancies. A lot of banks are looking at waiting. Um, I've heard murmurs around mainly May, sort of mm. time when a lot of banks are thinking that they'll actually be able to offer services to TPPs. Um, that's not us, by the way. Um, and as you can see, by, by, you've used our logo. Um, but yeah, I mean, largely, in, in terms of where banks feel they are, I think there's a lot of waiting at the moment, but largely when it comes to it, it's digital strategy, it's digital transformation, at which a lot of banks are looking at at the moment. Thanks, Richard. So uh, I would like to uh, move to Chris again. Uh, same question, but a little different. Um, so when it comes to CMA 9, probably you can explain CMA 9 better than me. Uh, so uh, when it comes to CMA 9, whether it's uh, looking at it from the same perspective or different? So that's the question. So yeah, I mean, the, 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 first of all, I mean, the CMA 9 are the nine biggest uh, banks by market share in, in that trade in the UK. Um, in terms of business, small business and uh, consumer uh, current accounts, so they account for a nine, o, o, over ninety percent of, uh, of of those customers of those accounts. Now um, they are all mandated by law to adopt and go live with the um, open banking standard in January this year, uh, next year, January twenty eighteen. Um, now, I can't comment on the individual banks, but as a general principle, what I would say is that having a great API is increasingly becoming a very important strategy for any business. Um, and I think, as far as banking is concerned, it's another channel. You can look at it as another channel. I think in time it will become the most important channel. Um, and particularly in, in the context of PSD2, when we're thinking about the, you know, the opportunity, and by the way, those slides are absolutely brilliant. Can I steal some of those slides? I'll talk to you <laughs> afterwards. That, that show how you know, TPPs can un unlock um, the value and, and, and the data across multiple bank accounts for a, for, for a customer. Um, you know, the API could quite, quite easily conceivably become the most prevalent and most important channel for a bank. So some banks have looked at PSD2, and I'm not commenting on any of the CMA9. Some banks have looked at this as a threat, as a compliance thing. They will do the bare minimum to, um, you know, to comply, and they, they will do it begrudgingly. But you know, I believe that the smart way of looking at this is as an opportunity and to embrace um, APIs as a strategy and um, to go further than the, the, the regulations and the standards apply. And I think what you'll see is that um, some banks will do that, and particularly, you know, challenger banks will probably push uh, faster and, 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 and further, and that hopefully will push the whole industry, because really what we want is uh, the, the carrot and not the stick here. We want banks to adopt this because it makes sense, because they can partner with third or via third parties, offer better services to their customers, and therefore they're more likely to grow and retain those, their, their customer base. And I think that's the, that's the right way of looking at it. And most of the people that we engage with across the CMA9 and across the entire industry for that matter, most of the individuals, regardless of what company they work for, most of them are kind of driven by that. They want to make, you know, do, do the very best job they can because that's the future of banking. Thank you. So uh, with that, I'll move to Prabhat uh, from the concepts to uh, the implementation details. Now with the, the standards, we are exposing the um, financial capabilities as APIs, as well as the financial institutes now creating connectivity in, uh, outside the bank as well. So security is a really important thing. So how does the uh, security architecture looks like, as well as uh, for the implementation architects, uh, how they should consider security?
<coughs> value added by both PST2 and open bank into the fintech industry. You see uh, how it works today with uh, without those standards in place. Uh, it's not just in Europe, even in, in US. If we are to share our banking data with a third party, uh, we have to share our credentials with them and they'll do screen scraping. So they basically will get our credentials and many can a human will just access that particular banking site and get our information. So doing that, it's, it's, a, it's at a huge inherent risk. And also it uh, leaves us with a lot of challenges. We don't know what data they are going to access. They can do anything with our account since like after we share the credentials. Right? And that also makes a lot of people like worry about using third parties, giving access to their banking data to third parties. <coughs> With PST2 and uh, open banking standard in place, they define a, a well-defined interface to share your banking data with third parties, along with a well-defined access control model. And speci specifically, if you look at the uh, open banking specification, it talks about using O2 and OpenID Connect. So with that, you don't need to worry about sharing your credential with a third party to get advantage of those services. So that's, for me, it's the, like, the best uh, advantage in terms of security, the PST2 and Open Banking. And then again, uh, uh, with all these benefits, we cannot like, uh, forget the new threat vectors introduced by these standards. <coughs> so before this, it's the, all the banks worked as a closed system. You don't expose your APIs, uh, the customer data, uh, to the, the rest of the world in a public manner. But now they do that. So this is the very important factor why you need to follow security religiously. You need to have a very well-defined process from the development stage, uh, from the design stage, to development stage, then to the uh, deployment stage. And another important thing I want to talk about is uh, the GDPR thing. Right? So GDPR, some people think, okay, the GDPR and PST2 are two opposite things. So PST talks about like sharing data, while the GDPR talks about sharing data in much more restrictive manner. But that's not the case. Uh, all three, like uh, PST2 as a directive, and open banking as a specification, and GDPR as a regulation. So all three fit nicely into build a very securely a uh, robust financial platform to share data between banks. Thanks, Parabhat. It's very informative. Uh, so with that, I'll go to Mashe. Uh, since we are not directly involved with PSD2 and open banking, but uh, heavily involved with the security, uh, so the, um, uh, the um, what's the role of O2 and OIDC and UMA play in the financial domain? I think that's a that's a really good question because we now have um, we now have a set of regulations right and remedies that uh, that we have to satisfy and uh, there is a clear need that, that the technologies that um, are used by financial institutions um, fit those precisely as an, as an open banking right uh, we need to uh, rely on OAuth and Open ID Connect and these two technologies they they've been built specifically to. Um, uh, to protect the APIs, right? So in, in case of OAuth, we, we have a technology which allows us to, um, to delegate access to a third party so that it can start accessing uh, certain resources within a financial institution in a secure manner without sharing the credentials, right? So there's only a, a specific uh, scoped, uh, well-defined token that's shared between um, one party and, and the other. And um, the OpenID Connect uh, goes... Uh, one step further, so it builds on top of OAuth. Many of you probably know that, or most of you know that technology. It builds on top of OAuth, and uh, what it does is that it adds that identity layer. So we now not only uh, delegate access to a particular um, API within a financial institution, but we can also um, we can also provide some um, um, identity information to the to the third party. So we can uh, we can go to the third party, provide. Um, certain attributes uh, about uh, about the user and um, as we've seen at, at the keynote we now um, start building that uh, ecosystem with a with a uh, trusted uh, third party with uh, with financial institution with, with the user and um, information starts flowing uh, outside of the bank right in a secure way uh, to to uh, to different parties and um, one of the interesting, very interesting technologies that um, um, provides even 
a more advanced mean of protecting that information is, is UMA. Mm -hmm. It actually um, uh, tries to provide this centralized consent management system that um, uh, would allow the user, the, um, in the open banking space, this would be the, the payment service uh, user, uh, who'd be able to see uh, what kind of permissions have been given to what parties, and, and you know have this global view across all the uh, all the accounts um, or all the um, all the financial institutions that are engaged for that particular uh, uh, for that particular user. So looking at these free technologies, OAuth um, as the um, access management or access delegation protocol, OpenID Connect as the um, identity federation protocol, and UMA as the more advanced um, access management or consent management uh, technology that um, you know. Looking at this, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's crucial. Uh, Prabhav mentioned the GDPR, and GDPR, you know, that's yet another um, thing that uh, emerged recently. And uh, you know, looking at that UMA, so providing this consent management, not only now delegating access, but making sure that the user sees how the data flows, has very specific controls over the data. It's uh, it's important and actually necessary as well. Okay, thanks. So I'll give a break. For, I'll, I'll skip Seishi and give you a break because you delivered a long keynote. Yes. <laughs> and go back to Chris. So Chris, the uh, European Union is struggling with uh, compliance due to uh, lack of uh, common standards, but uh, UK, uh, the open banking standard helping for better compliance. So uh, a little bit uh, explain about uh, the experience in UK as well as any plans that uh, to roll out these standards outside UK as well as uh, to other banks. Sure. So, I mean, I think we, we've been very fortunate in the UK and I think what the CMA did to, uh, a year ago when they set up open banking in the UK was a very smart move to kind of force the uh, nine biggest banks to comply with a, a single standard. And what, what you're seeing now across Europe is a number of other standards. Some of them are open standards, some of them are not open, they are kind of proprietary, some of them are individual banks creating their own sort of APIs. Um, I think all, all, all that's great up to a point, but there's a very serious risk of fragmentation, and that could be damaging to banks, could be damaging to third parties, and ultimately could be damaging to consumers. Particular, I'm, I'm less concerned with the functional API side of things. That's less of an issue, but it's still important. Um, and what, what do I mean by that? So um, I think if you look at most of these standards across Europe, they they're kind of big on the functional API side of things. They're very light when it comes to um, the auth authentication authorization protocols. They talk about potentially lots of different options that, that, that could be open. And that's kind of the elephant in the room with all of this. You need to have, first and foremost, a proper way of managing customers' identity and managing the authorization authentication process. If you, if, 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 if you don't have that, if that's not a standard, then that's the biggest risk. Um, and that's something that I think in the UK we are probably one to two years ahead of anything else that's out there as a, as, as a, a widely adopted standard. Um, I'm not saying we've got it perfect, but I would really urge anyone to think very strongly about proposing or getting behind other methods of authentication or any method of any, any security profile which doesn't have the weight behind it of a, you know, a, a, an open and widely adopted global standard. So that's why we've gone with OAuth2 and OpenID Connect, and we're working very closely with the Financial API Working Group, subset of, of, of the OpenID Foundation, to make sure that what we've got is a framework that does have a you know, global support as, as a way of protecting customers, and I think that's really important. I'm not saying other methods won't work. UMA is very interesting. My concern about UMA as a, as a model is potentially um, you know, that requires a contract with third parties and banks, which is problematic because PSD2 says there can be no contract between third parties and banks. So I think, you know, the, my, you know I think there's, there's lots, of, lots of ways this could play out. I suppose my, you know, my, my slightly sort of... Uh, uh, I, I mean, you take it with a pinch of salt, but my comment would be, you know, ideally everyone should just adopt the standards that we're building, and we, we will work to make those standards, uh, you know, cater for the full set of, of, of PSD2 requirements. Um, I'm not saying everyone should just adopt them, but they can do it at the moment. Our standards are an open standard there. Anyone can adopt, adopt those standards. But 
um, you know, it, it, this, this fragmentation is, is, is something that could create a risk. One, one thing we've actually done that I think, is, again, is a step, step forward from uh, anything else that's out there is created in the UK, the Open Banking Directory, which is a kind of trust framework for all third parties and, and, and banks, all participants, to trade. It's, it's a bit like a marketplace. It has an element of self-management, of discovery, so a third party can automatically discover any other banks that are onboarded. A third party, over time, will be able to automatically onboard without having to go and register with any individual bank's developer portal or API portal. So the, that's, that's where we're working towards is a model that will enable third parties to automatically onboard with any bank uh, that's, that's registered. And similarly, banks can auto-discover and see what third parties exist. Um, and and they, you know, it's, a, it's a way of managing trust in the ecosystem. And that's something I think that's very important to uh, kind of provide that clarity and that trust and to accelerate uh, development. Thanks, Chris. So I'll go back to Richard. Uh, you directly involved with uh, these initiatives. So what are the challenges and uh, bottlenecks that you see uh, when it comes to PSD2 or uh, larger open banking initiatives? So some of this will be fairly appropriate for most banks. Um, as I say, PSD2, I think we tend to forget that it's actually there's a payment regulation part of this as well. It's a big part. It's, it's mainly the second step to the first one. And we'll find that most banks, including ourselves, are well structured to deal with that type of regulation or change. Um, you need to be. We've been in banking. There's lots of regulation. Again, as I said previously, the big change of PSD2 over PSD1 is the new concept of third-party payment providers. And I think that largely depends on what you're currently doing as a bank as to where your bottlenecks would likely be. If you're undergoing some sort of digital transformation, and harking back to what Chris was just saying, and doing it in an open way, rather than trying to adopt lots of black box proprietary standards, you're probably in a good place. Yes, you're diverting resources to you know, maybe build new APIs you weren't planning on building before, but largely, in terms of technology stack, understand the business, get in the budget, that sort of thing. To achieve compliance, you're probably not far off. It's probably not really a bottleneck. Um, I think Chris sort of uh, did touch on sort of the vendor relationship part. Now, banks do vendor relationships. I mean, it's all about relationships, banking. But how do you... Manage is probably the wrong word, but facilitate um, third-party payment relationships. Contracts are also the wrong word, but how do you form the level of understanding and, and all that? Um, and I think one of the, maybe the bigger changes is down to authentication. A lot of banks have had mobile apps, online banking, so therefore have a level of authentication which they already supply their customers. But a lot of the two-factor methods are more time-based than transactional-based. And to move to a transactional-based 2FA mechanism may cause banks bottlenecks, mainly because you're having to basically replace your devices you've got in the user community. Originally, you had your own time frames in terms of, oh, I'm going to go online banking, I'm going to dish out all these new card readers or whatever else. But now you've got a deadline for facilitating um, secure customer authentication, which for a few banks does mean changing the two-factor authentication device. Yeah, thanks. So, Prabhat, you um, explain about uh, the standards and then why security is a must. Uh, so, if you can go in detail and explain how a solution can be um, uh, tested and then make sure it's a foolproof, uh, security is uh, to be foolproof in a PSU2 compliant solution. Uh, any advice from you uh, to the architects and implementation engineers? Sure, yeah. So, uh, one, one key change uh, PSU2 introduces on top of its predecessor is the emphasis it put on uh, security and also the custom authentication requirements for mobile and internet uh, The ECB and EBA together, so they put forward the RTS and RTS regulatory technical standard for strong custom authentication requirements 
and that itself defines a set of security guidelines uh, and set of best practices along with set of exemptions. So uh, the, the point is uh, both the, the beauty is like uh, both the PST2 and even if you take open banking specification, so both these two specifications themselves define the guidelines and the best practices that one should follow to build a robust, secure financial infrastructure. Uh, since you asked, let me give some examples. Right? If you take uh, PST2, PST2 talks about and it in fact recommends to use uh, open and common standards, uh, security uh, standards to facilitate communication between all the entities in the PST2 ecosystem. And if you look at open banking specification, it follows that guidelines and it builds its security profile on top of, of on top of Open ID Connect and OAuth 2. So I think uh, Mashay mentioned like uh, the OAuth 2 is a framework. Right? So when it is a framework, it has so many options to do the same thing. Right? But in, in financial domain, it's critical to make sure that everything we do is topmost secure. To address that need, open banking specification along with its uh, security profile along with the financial API working group under OpenID Foundation. So they define specific requirements uh, to make O2 and OpenID Connect much easier to make that work fine with the uh, financial use cases. So that's that's one thing. Another another example is. PST2 uh, talks about the session timeouts and also uh, the methods or the approaches to fight against brute force attacks. It specifically talks about to make the inactivity time or the idle time of a user when he gets redirected to the banking site or the login page, the idle time should not exceed five weeks. Okay. So if someone is on the banking, the login, after logging, you are on the banking site for more than five minutes, you need to terminate the session. And in terms of uh, uh, preventing brute force attacks, the PST2 spec recommends to use uh, account locking policies. So uh, based on the number of free tries, let's say after any number of free tries, with all the other factors involved, you can decide whether to lock the account permanently or temporarily. And spec specifically says that the value of N should not exceed five. So that means you should, you must lock the account if the failed number of attempts goes beyond five. And both uh, uh, Open Banking and PST2 once again uh, recommends using uh, uh, transport level security, TOS 1.2, to secure all your data in transit. And also it talks about securing your data, the, the confidentiality and the integrity of your data at risk. Uh, if I go to more specific stuff, like uh, uh, the open banking spec says you use TLS 1.2 with cipher suits which support uh, uh, perfect forward secrecy. So that means like if somebody collect all your data uh, uh, which, which travels over the wire, and in the future if you use uh, a, a cipher suit which support the uh, perfect forward secrecy algorithm, still they cannot like, even they have access to private key they cannot detect the session key and decrypt the data. Uh, so that's one thing. And also, it recommends to use HTTP uh, strict uh, transport only uh, protocols. So that will make sure your APIs can only be accessible through HTTPS. And apart from that, uh, uh, it also talks about uh, the value of uh, monitoring and fraud detection. You need to make sure that you have a proper fraud detection system in place in your bank, uh, which will uh, which will detect uh, the anomalous behaviors by by gathering users' past transaction patterns and from where the user initiated the transaction, the location of the payer, and also the location of the pay, and which devices they use. Like uh, if if the device is known to the bank already or it's an untrusted device, so you need to worry about all this stuff and. Open banking specification, when it defines the, the APIs, it talks about how the third parties can push data about the user to the banking system, and the banking system can use that in its own fraud detection system to find more effective uh, fraudulent patterns. 
and uh, few more things like apart from this uh, strong custom authentication uh, RTS, PSG2 <coughs> also uh, has two guideline documents, one for the uh, operational secret aspect of your company and other one is for incident reporting. So if you are like uh, uh, serious about the security aspect, then I recommend that you read the strong custom authentication spec, RPS, and then two security guidelines on the operational security aspect, and the other one on uh, incident reporting. And also the open banking specific in itself has a, a complete chapter on security, and uh, then again the security profile of it. So uh, the bottom line is like, uh, Security, security is not uh, like it's not a deployment only thing, right? So there are some like component in the development phase too. So you not so don't just worry about the deployment stuff. So you need to also worry about uh, how you the what are the standards and what is the process you follow from the design stage and what is the process you follow to pick software to build <laughs> your financial system. So everything you need to worry about. You should follow static code analysis and you need to do dynamic code analysis stuff uh, to make sure you use uh, full proof code. So all these things actually mentioned in the, uh, the open banking specification. Uh, thanks, Prabhat. So to keep the uh, focus on security, I'll move back to Marshe. Uh, so what's the importance of strong and adaptive authentication in securing financial transactions? <laughs> Um, I think uh, the authentication um, itself, or adaptive authentication, right? These are extremely uh, important concepts. So we have uh, we have these two things, right? So we have the the security protocols like OAuth or OpenID Connect, uh, which are um, behind, before uh, the customer authenticates, and they also operate uh, after the customer authenticates, right? But the end goal is that the customer gets a session or a token in in the OAuth space, right? They they can interact with the bank. But the token is only as good as the as the authentication event, and we have, as, as Prabhav mentioned, we have the regulatory technical standard on strong customer authentication that mandates the use of um, of um, you know multi-factor or at least two-factor authentication. So we can obviously use something that that we have, something that we know, something that we are. And uh, I think um, <clears throat> I think the the authentication, adaptive authentication, can um, is now a space where where banks can innovate, where they can. Uh, start creating these strong methods to build trust with the identity of the user who comes through a trusted third party or directly from the bank. If, if we think of um, you know the existing methods, right? We, we authenticate with some you know credentials like username and password, maybe an OTP um, or a TOTP, <clears throat> and um, for you know a lot of people, a lot of um, in particular, I would say millennials, that's um, often unacceptable, right? So we try to, um, financial institutions try to look at uh, and creating this, uh, you know, authentication, customer authentication more, more appealing, yet still, uh, still secure. Uh, so, you know, adding biometrics, uh, maybe adding some other factors, as, as Prabhupada mentioned, maybe based on, on the, uh, on device information, uh, which is later even fed to the, some internal fraud systems. And, um, <clears throat> and looking at this, um, you know, strong uh, multi-factor authentication—that's that's one of the key things to to achieve like end-to-end -end security in the in the PSD2 or open banking space. And if we think just of the adaptive authentication, so uh, um, we have um, you know AISPs, right? So account uh, uh, gathering or uh, some kind of um, you know systems that allow us to look at uh, our accounts in a broad sense. Uh, so in this case, let's think of just authentication, right? But if we have transactions, transactions do require, by, um, by definition, they do require uh, something which uh, can adapt. Is it a low value transaction? Should we challenge the customer really, um, um, really strong, right? Should we require yet another factor, right, to be uh, provided so that we can um, verify if the identity is um, correct or not? Uh, if the if the if the transaction is of a really high value, maybe we want to you know provide a set of um, additional uh, checks. Uh, but in a, in any case, like the authentication itself, it should be to some extent looked separately from the Open ID Connect or OAuth protocols. It should be looked in a way that we understand that any kind of session or token that gets minted after the authentication is strong. And that all is based on whatever is provided by the customer or the device that they're using to the bank. Thanks, Moshe. 
So I'll move to Seishi. Uh, so Seishi is a person really hard to keep silent, but I managed to do it for a while. So yeah, so you, in your keynote, you talk about the technology and you talk about technology is an enabler to implement these things. At the same time, it can be a challenge as well because uh, we know most of the banking systems are legacy systems. Mm. Uh, so how you uh, uh, meet that challenge and what are the uh, uh, solutions that you think uh, that the architect should uh, take care of? Yeah. So, um, thanks for letting me speak again. <laughs> um, so, in our experience uh, working with uh, different types of banks, uh, both in UK and EU, uh, we've really seen a spread, a, a very widespread of banks which have different, um, different current circumstances and also different requirements uh, in becoming PSD2 compliant. So some of these banks are um, uh, completely looking at this as a compliance requirement, uh, whereas some of the others are looking at it at a, at a, at a broader level. Uh, and, and therefore, the bottlenecks are also very different as well that are spread across these different types of entities. Uh, some of the basic bottlenecks are, are like you mentioned, uh, the difficulty in now trying to expose data out as APIs uh, from um to, to, to really try to get that data out of the legacy uh, co-banking systems. So in, in order to kind of uh, meet that challenge, what you really need, uh, and, uh, and as I mentioned in the keynote as well, is not something that can just uh, do a one-time uh, transformation of the data as APIs, but you need something agile and you need something adaptable where you can both fix that to um, transform that data from the legacy systems out as APIs, but also be able to do that as and when necessary in the future, uh, when maybe when other regulations come in, and also to um, uh, provide or to, to make use of the benefits of the ecosystem. So having a, a good bunch of connectors uh, that can connect to different, different um, uh, underlying systems is, is very important. And the ability to build those connectors if you don't have them uh, within this, the solution that you're getting is also extremely important. Because you should not, uh, or banks should not get um, limited to a, a one-time implementation of PSG2 compliance. Um, on uh, the side of security, I'm sitting in the midst of <laughs> to security experts, uh, and, 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 and I would look to you to qualify this statement as well. Um, on the side of security, what we find is that certain organizations, certain banks, uh, they already have an identity provider which they're hoping to leverage for the requirements of strong customer authentication and consent management as well. Uh, but there are certain limitations in doing that because some of these identity providers were not meant to handle things like consent management, etc. So uh, the, the, the challenge is now whether you replace that altogether uh, and kind of shake the foundation of your co-banking system, which is really risky in my opinion, or how you can extend that or how you can uh, complement the existing identity mechanism with something that can add on uh, the necessary requirements that are specified in the RTS, uh, for example. And then on a more longer term basis, to understand that, uh, and, and this is kind of talking about those, uh, that different category of banks who are looking at this as an opportunity and not just limited to um, a compliance requirement, is that you need to be able to have those adaptable components uh, which you can utilize in the future. For example, when a lot of people look at PST2, they look at it as an API management problem or an identity and access management problem. But it also uh, is something for integration and, and as well as analytics. So if you don't have analytics within your PST2 uh, compliance or your open banking solution, then the, the journey that you can go within this um, transformation of this regulation into uh, broader businesses is, is very limited. So the importance of having these other components with you for this journey uh, to um, 
make use of them uh, is is absolutely a necessity. And if if uh, you don't have it, that could uh, end up as a huge bottleneck for you to go beyond just compliance. Okay, so that that uh, lead me to ask a question from Richard. Probably Misha can uh, add to that. Uh, so how is the cultural transformation? Mm -hmm. Now we talk about the technical mm -hmm. side of it, uh, how the banks are adopting and any challenges on the... Um, again, I'm, I'm, I keep weaseling my way out of this one. It really depends on where the bank is with their journey. So mm -hmm. I think it was the uh, boss of Amazon that said, disrupt or be disrupted. And one of Amazon's um, goals, business goals, is to disrupt themselves before they're disrupted by somebody else. I mean, let's face it, if it wasn't for PSD2, would digital to, did, would disruption come to the bank front office? Of course it would. Of course it would. You know, we've obviously got open banking. That's a, a facilitator for the, um, the CMA9. Um, and, you know, you've, you've, you've got um, challenger banks as well, which are also um, are providing an increased amount of competition in the uh, banking world. In terms of... Um, front office uh, disruption, I think it was always on the cards. It's always going to, whether it was going to happen this year, next year, the year after, it was always going to happen. As banks, we know that largely you have to be a bank to have a back end. But do we really want to give up the front end? And that's not a, oh, you know, we want to own everything sort of line. It's more of the, the customer is important. And owning that relationship with that customer, whether you want to call it ownership or, or whatever else, is a very, very important concept. Every, you know, banks have had a, a bit of a, a bad run over the last 10 years in terms of reputation, fair enough, but as um, Jessica's slide earlier, which is great, we're still that one as well, 74% um, um, of people would rather go into various fintech relationships with their bank than somebody else. So it really comes back to uh, what I was saying earlier. Digital transformation means different things to different mm -hmm. people. You know, we're banks, we're enterprises, we are heavily regulated. Yes, that does cause some problems in movement, but we need to align that to uh, the needs of our customers, integrating <coughs> with our customers our products in a way that they want to consume them. Not the way that we're making them, but the way that they want to consume them within their lives. Um, so, I mean, in terms of sort of the future around uh, banking, I think it's quite bright. Um, I don't, I don't really go with the electricity analogy as such. Um, although I think you might have stolen that one off of me about something else. Um, yes, banks are going to always have to be at the back. Uh, until something very revolutionary comes and, and, and kills the back office, like blockchain or, or some other implementation. But, let's say, banks want to have the front end. They want the front office. They want the front office because they believe it's the best way of interacting and protecting that customer. Anything to add from uh, HSBC? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think uh, from my perspective, uh, I, w what I see is that uh, the banks clearly see that uh, you know there there is an opportunity uh, in in actually opening up. So uh, I, I was um, I was watching some uh, TED talk uh, the other day, which mentioned uh, uh, an interesting statistics that um, more than seventy percent of millennials would rather go to uh, to the dentist that then uh, hear what the bank has to say and uh, kind of banks uh, understand that they have to adapt right and for digital transformation you know building uh, better relationships or opening up uh, i think they can um, <clears throat> they can achieve that they can um, uh, they can build on the trust that they already have with the customers uh, they can build on the relationships that, that, that they already have on the, on the data that they already have and uh, you know, providing APIs where, where fintechs um, you know, leverage those APIs, um, I don't think that's a that's a bad thing, and I don't see that banks necessarily consider this uh, this as a threat. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so the last round. Uh, so basically, you know, we are talking about PSD two and then a deadline in January. Uh, so I would like to ask from every, uh, each one of you, like, what you will see the next steps and what will be the future with these standards. Uh, so probably I'll start with the Chris. 
Yeah, so I think, as, as I said before, the, the next steps for us are that we are working with the CMA9 and a number of other uh, ASPSBs, a number of other banks, and a number of third parties to to, to go live in, in January, on January the 13th. That's really the start of something. It's not a, a big deadline that's, that's uh, you know, we've done... Uh, the first phase. It's really the start of the first phase, I, I, I would say. So what I expect to see over the course of 2018 is um, wider adoption. I'm sure there'll be some hiccups and challenges along the way, but, but you know, more than just the CMA9 adopting and going live with APIs, a growing marketplace of TPPs in the UK. Um, integration and collaboration with the rest of Europe, I think, is really important. And ultimately, the, there's a kind of, you know, RTS. We've spoken a lot about RTS. That's still yet to be completely finalised. I think um, we're, we're, we're looking at at least 18 to, 18 to 24 months away before RTS actually comes into force. So there's going to be, up until then, potentially quite a lot of, um, of, of movement. Um, and then the really exciting thing is, you know, this, uh, we've, we've seen a lot of interest from outside uh, Europe as well, from Australia, Japan, the Far East, India. You know, there's lots of interest in open banking as a, as a global concept. But January the 13th is a big date, but it's the start. Uh, Moshe, anything you can add? I, I would actually um, uh, second um, Chris, just saying that, um, yeah, I think that... Uh, 2018 will be this uh, kind of a start of a revolution. So we'll see how uh, fintechs adopt the APIs. We'll see how actually users react, how customers react, uh, how the ecosystem looks like. And I think this integration with the, um, uh, with the rest of the Europe will be uh, interesting as well. Okay. Richard, anything? Can I think we've seen some of the, I think everybody's been to enough of these conferences already and we see the, the typical um, use case of how a TPP might interact with a bank and let's face it, it's not that revolutionary. I think that, and I would hope to think that um, a lot of people have got their innovative ideas, I keep them to themselves at the moment, mm -hmm. um, ready to launch great innovative products moving forward um, in, in, into the new year, especially now you've, you've got this uh, regulation which you can leverage. Um, so I, I really think that from more of the fintech space, we've got a lot more to see in terms of uh, front office offerings, or traditional <coughs> front office offerings um, to, to, to customers. Um, but I think largely, um, as banks, um, if you're a really, really big bank, you've probably got lots of different types of customers and you've probably got a fair spread. If you're a smaller bank, you probably have um, customers that can be defined in multi, you know, various market segments. And those various market segments might not necessarily want to adopt a, um, a, a, a fintech product to do something interesting with their banking. And this is coming back to uh, what I was saying, that digital transformation is integrating, well, as I see, integrating what you offer into customers' lives in the way they, what, that, that benefits them, that the, in the way that they want to consume them. Almost like electricity, but not quite. Um, and PSD2 might not necessarily um, provide the fintechs the ability to um, effectively give my customers what they want, but I should be. And it's really for us as, or as, us as banks to ensure that we are giving customers the experiences they want from the products that they are consuming from yourselves. Thanks, Richard. So, Seshi, I am uh, expecting a different answer from you, especially focusing on the solution side. Yeah. With all these changes that we will predict, uh, yeah. what is your roadmap and then what will happen uh, with the solution? Uh, if you can give some insight into that. Sure. So it's, it's actually very encouraging to hear that uh, banks are look, taking this responsibility as their own to you know, not rely on the fintechs, uh, but to, to take this responsibility to provide those customer experiences on their own. And especially in order to do that, um, as I said before, uh, obviously your, your solution or your technology that you uh, embrace yourself with to, to take on that journey, not just for compliance but for everything beyond that, has to be uh, not a closed system but it has to be the components that can help you uh, in, in each step of the way. So in terms of the, the solution roadmap, um, what, we, what we have and what we're currently doing is basically 
right now, most of the banks are obviously very, very focused on getting compliant. Uh, but um, as, as Chris mentioned as well, January 13th is only the start of that, that journey. So beyond January 13th, we are looking at banks needing to integrate APIs of different uh, you, you know, when banks become or provide those third-party services, they, they're needing to integrate APIs across different um, entities, especially in Europe, where currently there is no single standard that everyone can converge to. Uh, in, in terms of incident reporting that is required for uh, this payment initiation, for example, uh, the, the requirement to do fraud detection, and, and not just, just basic fraud detection, but adaptive fraud detection that only uh, a very strong analysis analytics um, engine can, can provide. Uh, and then also, in the more longer term, uh, how to uh, monetize these APIs, uh, how to create insights out of this data, as I mentioned in the keynote as well, uh, how to create insights out of this data. So you need an analytics engine especially to reap the actual benefits out of that system. Uh, or the ecosystem. So in terms of product roadmap, we've got all of that uh, all lined up very well uh, so that you can smoothly and seamlessly transition from uh, becoming compliant uh, to um, uh, kind of taking the advantage of that underlying um, technology elements within that solution to um, in order to achieve uh, these other goals of um, uh, taking banking beyond what it is today. And obviously, um, we have seen nothing yet. Uh, this is, th we, we are all just predicting what can be. But over the years, when the competition kicks in and the, the fintechs are providing these amazing customer experiences and the roles of the banks change themselves, uh, it could be a completely different picture when we come back here maybe next year. Uh, and it is very, very vitally important that the technology component uh, is able to adapt um, and be agile to um, function within those uh, changing uh, requirements. Thanks, Ishi. Uh, Prabhat, uh, quick uh, input from you, how security and then how we are yeah. going to face the challenges. Yeah, and it's, it's really good to see that a uh, lot of initiatives happen in Europe, like we have a GDPR, uh, PhD2 at EU level, and we have open banking in UK. Uh, but if you look at US, like it's kind of very blasey approach they take. <laughs> and uh, maybe like you are surprised to hear that in US there is no uh, federal level privacy regulation. So that's why we need to have this EU US uh, privacy shield to uh, to tra transfer data from EU to a US based company. So I would like to see this, all these uh, EU initiatives will trigger a global interest and uh, all these standards would be globalized and uh, people around the, the world would want to use this stuff. Thanks. So with that, we are coming to the end of this panel and I would like to thank uh, Richard, Chris and Moshe. Uh, I know you guys are really busy to meet the deadlines. Uh, with that, uh, accepting our invitation and being here, the information is really valuable. And uh, thanks, Sishi and Prabhat as well, joining the panel. And I would like to thank two other people who helped um, us to uh, organize this panel. Senaka Fernando, I think he's somewhere here. He's our director of uh, Solutions Architecture, who helped to uh, uh, link with the panelists. And then uh, Kushlani Di Silva, who is uh, the marketing arm of the uh, financial solutions team, uh, put a huge effort. Thank you, guys. And uh, thank you all uh, attending the panel. Unfortunately, we couldn't take any questions, but most of the panelists will be around. You can uh, reach them um, and then ask your uh, questions. Uh, thanks again, and have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay.